and welcome back to the Cincy Reform Podcast. It's been a little while since we've been in the same room, uh, but it's nice to uh, return to our old way of doing things and uh, welcome you uh, back to join us this week. Uh, we're going to be thinking this week about the Lord's Prayer. And we were talking about this, and while we might have touched on this in the past, it feels like this is something that uh, is worth uh, revisiting at least every year. Uh, but the, the Lord's Prayer is definitely a a centerpiece within our particular congregation. I think it is um, very uh, of, of great significance, biblically speaking, and uh, Christians around the world um, utilize the Lord's Prayer oftentimes uh, weekly in their worship services and uh, quite regularly within uh, daily family worship and private worship. Uh, the Lord's Prayer certainly is worthy of um, a central place and so um, as we come to this uh, prayer, we're, we're coming to something that has uh, really been, you know, from the most ancient uh, years in the church's history, a, a prayer that's been used to catechize, uh, to prepare converts uh, for mature uh, Christianity, and something that um, has been, you know, remarked upon by many um, of the church fathers and many important theologians. And we have a number of, of those quotes to share with you um, as we kind of work through uh, the Lord's Prayer uh, today. Um, but let me just begin here with a really helpful quote from uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. Um, Augustine, the uh, church father who wrote that famous work, The Confessions, which is probably his most widely read book, uh, pr the most uh, in uh, influential church father for the Western church. Uh, one who certainly is, uh, guides us within our church. But here's what he says about the Lord's Prayer. Whatever be the other words we may prefer to say, we say nothing that is not contained in the Lord's Prayer, provided, of course, we are praying in a correct and proper way. So as he comes to the Lord's Prayer, he sees that this is really the summation of what appropriate prayer is. And we don't go beyond it. We certainly don't want to say less than it, but it really becomes the thing that captures the essence uh, of Christian uh, prayer. And when we do come to this prayer, we are um, right to, to note the preface of the prayer, our Father uh, who art in heaven. And when we think then about this uh, opening, um, uh, this, this opening phrase, this address uh, to, uh, to our Heavenly Father, we're, we're coming to the Lord with an exalted hearts. Uh, we come and we begin the prayer in such a way where we are lifting hearts and minds up to uh, heaven and ad addressing the first person of the Trinity, our Father in heaven, um, reminding ourselves that, yes, God has revealed himself to us as a, a father, but not as an earthly one. And so we, we lift our hearts, we lift our minds and here's a wonderful quote from uh, St. John Chrysostom. From the moment that you said, Our Father who art in heaven, the expression elevated you, gave you wings to your thoughts, showed you that you have a Father in heaven. Do nothing, say nothing, that belongs to the earth. So I think very helpful way of uh, opening up a prayer uh, we don't open um, any prayer with lowly thoughts and lowly speech. We're not coming to God as if he's just a buddy or a pal and just speaking to him as we might speak to some other human being, some chit-chat, but we are exalting hearts and minds uh, to the God in, who's in heaven. Randy, you want to kind of take us off with the, uh, the first three petitions? Yeah, so the first three petitions are uh, petitions for God. And it's in, I think it makes sense. It flows, you know, as uh, Chris Awesome said, you know, the moment you say our Father in heaven, uh, he says that expression elevated you. And now that we're kind of elevated in this heavenly place, it's, I think it's natural to say, hallowed be thy name. Um, and that's the first petition we ask. We ask it even before we ask for our daily bread, uh, before we ask for our own needs. What are we asking? God calls your name 
to be hallowed in this in this area. Cause your name to be hallowed uh, around around the globe and for um, various uh, people groups to see uh, the beauty of your name and may it be reverenced. It, it's a great petition. It's uh, the song of the angels as they sang, "Glory be to God in the highest." Um, Think of, thinking about all of the needs that we have, bodily needs that we have, uh, the, the, the things that we, we face in this fallen world. Uh, we face hunger and we face sin and temptation. But one day, all of those will fade away. Uh, in the new heavens and new earth, uh, there won't be temptation for sin. There's not going to be starvation and famines and these kinds of things. So in, in, in one sense, some of these petitions that we're going to be talking about in the Lord's Prayer will fade away and we won't need to say them anymore. But this one never fades away. You know, hallowed be your name. Cause your name to be hallowed in this place. That's a petition that will uh, stand the test of time and be something that we're all about for eternity. Um, and after we say, hallowed be thy name, we then say, thy kingdom come. Uh, we want God's kingdom to come. We're all about God's kingdom. We're citizens of God's kingdom. And we want the kingdom to advance. One of the Puritans, uh, Herman Witsius, he said, There are only two great empires in the world. The one is the empire of God, the other is that of the devil, who is the God, lowercase g, of this world. Whoever does not belong to the kingdom of God, in which nothing but happiness is to be found, must belong to the kingdom of the devil, which contains only unmixed misery. So we want God to advance his kingdom by saving sinners, by, as, as the church proclaims the gospel, as the Holy Spirit awakens lost sinners to see and behold Christ, uh, we, we want to see the gospel advance. We want to see the, the, the mission of, of the church advance so that God, via the Holy Spirit, working in conjunction with the word, can advance his kingdom and his prerogatives around the world. So we want his name to be hallowed, we want his kingdom to come, and then we, the third petition that we uh, pray for God, thy will be done. Uh, again, Herman Witsius said, let us return to the school of Jesus, where we are taught by this petition that denying our own will, we are bound to acquiesce entirely to the decreeing will of God, both in prosperity and in adversity. And it is kind of a scary thing sometimes to pray, Thy will be done, isn't it? Uh, I, I met a Christian one time. He said before he was before he became a Christian, he would his parents would lead him in the Lord's prayer, and he said he would say the prayer but stop with Thy will be done because he didn't want God's will to be done. He wanted his own will to be done, and he was aware that he wanted his own will to be done, and he wouldn't pray it. Uh, and then he talked about becoming a, a Christian and how freeing it was to say, yes, this is, you know, uh, I'm, you're, you're in, in a sense, there's a sense of giving up some of your own autonomy, but you never had it to begin with. God's will will be done, and we want that to happen because it is a perfect will. And even when uh, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death at times, when we walk through painful circumstances at times, we know that he will use everything for our good, and he will bring the best good out of it. He is disciplining us for holiness. He is treating us as sons and daughters of the kingdom, and he loves us. And we're never going to be separated from his love. And so we want his will to manifest because his will is the perfect will. His plan is the perfect plan. His kingdom, the perfect kingdom. So as we're praying, you know, thy will be done. And as we just pray, thy kingdom come and hallowed be thy name. We uh, begin our time in prayer. Just again, focusing on God and wanting all of the prerogatives of God, the plans of God, to, to manifest, to increase, not only uh, increase around the world, but increase in us as well, in our hearts. Um, and then after we pray about God, we go on to praying for our own petition, because God cares for us, right? That's right, that's right. But that order is obviously pretty important, isn't it? I think that maybe this is the kind of thing where, um, before we consider those petitions for ourselves, just to pause for a second and to just invite you to reflect upon your own prayers that you offer up daily. Uh, maybe if you're a pastor of a church, thinking about uh, how, how you're praying um, publicly and corporately. 
and recognizing that when Christ gives us the Lord's Prayer, he does spend the first half just celebrating God, and celebrating God's kingdom, and celebrating God's reign, and that, that kind of a, um, the ordering of putting that first, making that primary, is so important to then situate our own needs. Uh, because if we just begin with our prayers, and I think a lot of times people um, only pray throughout the day when they have a quick need, and they want to pray to God for their need, and that's fine, that's, you know, that's good. I mean, we're, we recognize a need, and we want to come to the Lord just quickly. We're in a meeting, maybe. We are um, uh, asking God for grace as we're you know, trying to uh, successfully parent uh, wild kids. I don't know whoever would do that. <laughs> Uh, but need some patience, asking God for patience in the moment. And we might not have the time at that moment to go through the entire structure of a good, well-structured um, prayer. But the problem can be when all we do is quickly jump to our needs only, and we don't follow the structure that uh, Brandon just unpacked for us, to begin with God's glory and then move into our good. Uh, but you know, like Brandon said, God certainly wants us to come to him with our needs for our good, it's just we need to have our priorities and to uh, certainly prioritize the glory, the kingdom, and the reign and will of God. Uh, when we think about the uh, petitions that Christ gives us, uh, the three for ourselves, uh, it moves from body, uh, you know, our, our physical needs, uh, and then to the kind of forensic, you could say, the forgiveness, to then the kind of preservation of us, of our life. Um, and, and it moves uh, in a very, I think, important uh, manner from the temporal to then the, the spiritual and uh, the, the twofold spiritual. So when we uh, pray, give us this day our daily bread, a uh, helpful comment from uh, Gregory of Nyssa, when Jesus says bread, he includes all that is necessary for the body. So give us our daily bread means give us sufficient shelter from the elements. It means give us water for our thirst, uh, give us food uh, for our hunger, Give us all that we need physically that we might then uh, live for God's glory. Uh, I like to say to our congregation, you know, God, Christ tells us, ask for our bread. Uh, we don't ask for our filet mignon, our daily you know, steak. Now, God might give us our daily steak, and we give, God, give him thanks for that. But we do come for the sake of our needs. We come and ask him to meet us um, with asking him humbly to, to care for, for our bodies. And then we move into, as I mentioned, the uh, forensic, the, the uh, forgiveness of sins. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And uh, the ancient father, Tert Tertullian, uh, wrote this. A debt in scripture is an image of a wrongdoing, because wrongdoing always owes a debt to judgment and is avenged by it. And so as we come then to the Lord, and as we are... Rec, uh, requesting the um, our, our physical needs be met, we then immediately go to those spiritual needs and we begin with forgiveness because we have uh, offended God's law. Um, we are uh, debtors, especially to him. But when Christians come and ask God for the forgiveness of our sins, we as Christians um, also must be merciful toward others. Otherwise, we clearly don't know the mercy of God. And so these two things are then intertwined for us, that we might be directed not only to God's mercy, but to be mindful as well about our own readiness to extend mercy uh, toward other people, and to not only want forgiveness for our own possession, but to be forgiving towards others as well. And so that uh, movement um, is, is, of course, uh, uh, very important because then as we then move into the idea of being preserved within the Christian faith, of lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> we are thinking about people who are um, you know, for, uh, Christians, forgiven by God, um, given our uh, bodily needs, and then we're going out into the world and we're going into a very dangerous place as those who've been joined to Christ and his cross, and we are then subject to attack by the evil one. And so we then need our God to um, give us preservation, to guide our steps, and to ensure that we're not then overcome by our many uh, enemies, uh, including, um, uh, including uh, the devil himself. Uh, Thomas Watson wrote this uh, very helpfully. The meaning of this petition is that God, 
would not allow us to be overcome by temptation, that we may not be given up to the power of temptation and be then drawn into sin, to be captured by it, and to be then subjected to it and ruled uh, by, by that, um, that great enemy. So, uh, Brian, would you mind uh, maybe just uh, talking about the closing here? And there's a couple, you know, uh, textual manuscript things that go on and mm-hmm. you know, some differences that the Protestants often have from the Roman Catholics. Would you mind commenting sure. on that? Sure. Yeah, so the Protestants, will typically, we, might, we might typically end the Lord's Prayer with, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, and some of the older translations of the Bible will include that in Matthew's Gospel, as Jesus says, pray like this, and he goes through the Lord's Prayer, and then you might see, like in the old King James, uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. But, you know, as we've, as we've learned more about manuscripts and we've, we've, we've discovered more, we see that the earliest and the best manuscripts don't actually include that ending of the Lord's Prayer. And you'll probably notice in a lot of the modern day translation of the Bible, for example, the ESV, will have mentioned the ending in a footnote, but it won't put it actually in the Bible itself because it'll it'll mention that the earliest and the best manuscripts don't have the ending. So it was probably not original uh, to Matthew's Gospel or to Luke's Gospel. Uh, but nevertheless, we can still pray that. Uh, we can still pray that because, one, it's true. Uh, <laughs> for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's, it's, it kind of ends with this doxological truth uh, to God. Uh, it's biblical. We actually see that these phrases in the Bible elsewhere, maybe not in Matthew's gospel or Luke's gospel, but we, we see this phrase in Scripture. So I think it's always appropriate. To pray scripture. So, for example, in First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine, uh, it speaks about you. Know, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all power and might. Glorious name. So it kind of uses that these uh, the same kind of words here in First Chronicles twenty-nine. Also, Daniel chapter seven, God was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So we see this, the, the, uh, these words and these phrases elsewhere in Scripture. It's always appropriate to, to pray that, and, uh, and of course it's a true statement. So uh, in the Protestant tradition in our church, we find it um, helpful to pray that kind of doxological ending as we close the Lord's Prayer. Uh, any other thoughts that you wanted to add to that? No, I, I think that that's uh, just helpful, and I don't think that this is something that we need to get hung up on. I, I've heard uh, some um, well, well-intentioned Roman Catholics uh, criticize Protestants for this sort of uh, addition. And I say, is that really a problem? I don't think so. But I also would say, too, it's not. it would not then be wrong to conclude it where it seems like Jesus probably concluded it, and uh, to, to not add the ending. I think that this is a kind of a, you can take it or leave it, but uh, follow whatever your your uh, uh, your church would have you do, though. And uh, utilize that and s- submit yourself to that uh, line of, of thinking and, and, and praying. So, so, Zach, as we close then, yeah. maybe you could reflect on, uh, should we pray the Lord's Prayer verbatim? How should we think about utilizing the Lord's Prayer in our church, in our home? Yeah, sure. I mean... Let me hear some of your thoughts too here, Brandon. I, I think that uh, when we are um, coming across this stuff in, in Matthew and in Luke, when Christ gives it to us, in one place he says, pray this, and then the other one he says, pray like this, which kind of covers our bases, doesn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. he's saying, hey, this is a pattern for your prayers, but it's also a prayer to use. And similar to how I think it's wise for us to use the Psalms as prayers, they're sung prayers, or they can be spoken prayers, Jesus himself gives us a prayer and says in uh, Luke, uh, pray this, say this. And then in Matthew, he also says, pray like this. And so then we're, we're using this as a, um, uh, something that should really, you know, back to where we started with Augustine, that this prayer is given to us in a way that is supposed to just capture and become a rubric for us, a a way to understand what Christian prayer is meant to be. If we had this like massive, like, 
you know, multi-page prayer, like the length of Psalm 119 that's given to us to say, hey, do this, pray like this. That might not be so helpful to use something massive and huge to guide us because we feel overwhelmed. We can't do it. But when you have something that's uh, broken down in such shorthand like this, well, then we have uh, something that's very bite-sized and then can be applied to something longer, can be applied to something shorter. And so I think that um, utilizing this prayer, both in, to say it verbatim, is an act of obedience to Jesus. What's better than obeying Jesus? So say it, repeat it. Uh, the Didache, uh, one of the earliest uh, post-biblical writings, said that Christians would pray three times a day. Most likely they're morning prayers and evening prayers, and then at noon they're praying the, saying the Lord's Prayer. And uh, that seems like a wonderful way to be obedient to our Savior and to subject ourselves to Him. But we shouldn't just stop there, right? Let's, let's also go beyond that. And if we were to break the Lord's Prayer up into its eight component parts of a, you know, a, a preface, a conclusion, and then six uh, petitions in the middle, well then let's make sure that we're including those different elements, uh, those eight different elements within our, our own personal prayers. That we don't get um, caught up in only praying for our daily bread, because that can be the only thing we ever pray for. But to remember to pray for those other things as well that uh, really form the bulk of the Lord's Prayer, the seven other parts of it. Don't lose those petitions, of course, but don't stop there as well. Yeah. What are some of your thoughts? No, I think that's exactly right. I think, um, uh, yeah, it's a helpful prayer to pray. It's um, certainly helpful to you know, teach to your children uh, and to kind of help them in their prayer life. I think it's a good prayer to, to start with. It kind of gives you um, kind of, a, again, like a rubric. And then you can, again, feel free to launch out and just continue on in, in the prayer and pray um, other things. But as Augustine said, you're really praying one of those elements, aren't we? I mean, it kind of it's pretty exhaustive in terms of the categories mm -hmm. that we see in the Lord's Prayer. So, yeah. yeah. It's uh, one thing that I have uh, seen some pastors do that might be helpful for our listeners is that they will actually just like say one of the phrases and then they'll you know add to that and pray according to that so mm -hmm. our father who art in heaven and then the pastor might pray and extol god in heaven and celebrate him um, and then hallowed be thy name and then pray for god's glory for a period of time and so that could also be something that uh, mm -hmm. you could do as well yeah. is to just proceed in that way of just repeating that line and then expounding upon that Go to the next line, then expound upon that, and so forth. That might be a practical thing that, that uh, could be done as well by um, by our listeners. But anything else? No. I hope I hope that this was a, a helpful episode. I'm glad that we're back together again, able to see you uh, by video or you see us by video. You can check out our other uh, podcast episodes at cincyreformed.org. And if you're in Cincinnati, come visit us at Westside Reformed Church. And you can visit our website, westsidereformed.org, and check out our sermons and other uh, information about our church. And uh, we'll see you next week.